morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I'm Stella Paul, Environment and Health Project Officer at Earth Journalism Network, and I warmly welcome you all today to this very special virtual roundtable. Today's event is a bit different than the usual webinars that you attend, because today it's going to be all about ground stories and sharing tips and <clears throat> describing challenges and how to overcome them uh, with uh, especially in a uh, challenging environment. And to do that and help us with, with good learnings from this event is a fantastic lineup of panelists from South Asia and Southeast Asia. But before I introduce you to our today's panelists, just a few points about uh, housekeeping. Today, we are aiming to wrap up in an hour, but we want you to ask your questions and be interactive with us. So you can ask your questions anytime during this uh, round table uh, using the Q&A button, which is at the bottom of your screen. We will be keeping a close eye on the Q&A page and we will try our best to see that your questions are answered. With that, now let me introduce to you our journalists and mentors who have joined us today. Uh, on my left, I see Finike Oloyan, who has joined us from Jakarta. Uh, Finike, hello. Hi, Shala. Evening from Manado, actually, not Jakarta. Evening. Evening to you. Um, to help Finike with the uh, translation, we have our senior uh, story coordinator at EJN from Indonesia, Florence Armin. Hi, Florence. Hi. Hi, Stella. Hi, everyone. Happy to be here. From Philippines, we have journalist Mark Jason and Romina, uh, who will be sharing with us their, challenge, their, their experience of reporting vector-borne and zoonotic diseases. Hello, Mark, and hi, Romina. Hello, good evening, everyone. Thank you for tonight, for this opportunity. From India, uh, Kerala, India, we have Aswati Jayashree, uh, who works uh, for uh, Deshavimani Daily in Kerala. Hi, Aswati, welcome. Thank you, ma'am. Hello, everybody. And finally, we have the expert in the house today, Jaya Sridhar from Chennai. Uh, Jaya is the senior health advisor at Internews and author of uh, e-learning materials on zoonotic diseases and many more. So Jaya, welcome. Mm, thank you, uh, Stella. I'm no expert, but so pleased to be here. I'm here to learn. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think the, the, the mood has already started to pick up here and the mood is going to be like this. We are going to share our personal experiences and our personal takes on how to report, how to get the story right on reporting of zoonotic diseases in a very challenging environment. So let me begin first with Mark and Romina. Mark, you won a grant from Arts Journalism Network and you reported on what must many people would probably regard a taboo subject, eating bats. And for that, you went right within the community where bats are a staple. So tell us, how was your experience? How did you manage to win the trust of the community? And how did you get this story, apparently a taboo subject, without any bias or any prejudice? Yes, uh, thank you, Stella. Well, uh, the, the report was initially, when I pitched the, grant, the proposal to the grant, it was initially just about a group of scientists, ecology, bat ecologists here in the Philippines who are researching on, who are going, going up the mountain, get, um, hunting some bats, getting some swab samples and setting them free. So at first it was an interesting topic for me because, you know, it's what, usually it's people who get swab. You know, that's the, that was the, uh, initial image of what we see about swabbing and then 
here scientists are taking swab samples from bats. So when I researched more into it, I re, uh, I got into you know the uh, to their the scientific endeavor of bats being you know the the, the what what is a suspected animal source of the COVID nineteen virus. And when I talked with my mentor Katharina, she mentioned that maybe you have a culture of an exotic uh, cuisine about bats. So that's where I delve. Uh, research more and found out about certain uh, indigenous community who regard who regard which regards bats as just a, a snack, not even a staple source of meat, just a snack. You know when they they're in the mood to eat bats because usually they eat, they catch the bats that are small. So basically, it's uh, chips for them. They just roast it and eat it like you know uh, you know sort of a chip or uh, chips or uh, a snack. So I think I think that was very interesting. As for biases, uh, getting into the community, uh, well, first of all, we wanted to be safe, so we got uh, swab, we got tested before, and uh, it wasn't. Uh, we got the trust of the indigenous leader by, I guess, by. Uh, I, how do I say this? Uh, in 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 the Filipino, we have a term like "nakuha mo yung loob ng tao." <laughs> so when you say "loob," it's inside. So basically, we we made them. We made the indigenous leader feel like. We are not here to cause any harm. We made them feel that we are, we can be trusted by talking to them, by trying to understand their situation. So I think that's an interesting way of establishing trust among journalists and between the journalists and the stores, especially at this precarious time. Very, very important uh, learning early on, you know, winning the trust making our intention clear to them that we are here just to get the information and not to you know impose our thinking on on them it is is probably the very first important step uh, mark i wonder if you have uh, you know any any uh, learnings uh, for us i believe you have a presentation that you want to share with us so please the floor is yours go ahead uh, thank you stella so uh, I'll be leading the presentation. My partner will be, you know, so Romina will. Start. I'll call Romina's attention for a few snippets uh, based on the photos. So I'll show my screen now. So is the. So is it okay? All right. So here I separate my presentation into two, bat virus hunters and bat eaters. And I wanted to focus more on pictures as was uh, to make it more, to have a more personal feel about our experience so we can share more about what we personally witnessed. So basically we hiked two mountains. The first mountain is the Mount Makiling and the second mountain is the Sharamada. So before that, these are the inspira this, this are the earlier stories, basically the related literature where I got the idea. Reuters first published a photo essay of the bat ecologist at the University of the Philippines, Los Baños in Laguna, the province here. And so University of the Philippines is one of the premier state universities here. And they have a, a sort of a biological unit where which specifically focus on zoonotic diseases. So that is what the uh, writers report focus on. So basically, they they were the first ones to coin them, these scientists or bat ecologists, as virus hunters because they personally go to the mountains to take swab samples from bats. So these are their methods. So what what really struck me as interesting is is that they catch yeah. the bats, but they do not kill the bats. So, so they, in fact, they take a very cons uh, uh, conserve animal conservation point of view about the, their scientific endeavor because. They only catch them with mist nets, and they did not uh, kill them, put them in jars, or in, or bring them to the lab laboratory to take some uh, to you know dissect them for virus samples. They basically just take swab samples, same way that the science, same way that we take swab samples from humans to detect the COVID nineteen virus. And then the other one is that the CGT ad published a uh, wrote a uh, made a documentary about basically the same virus hunters. So. But the difference is, so basically they repeated the story, but the difference is they went to a community in another, a nearby province and they, uh, they, uh, they call this, they uh, interviewed Filipinos who catch bats as pulutan. 
So as we go along, um, I read the stories of my other two grantees to talk more, more about, you know, the one is about the Nipah virus outbreak in India. The other is the wet market in North Sulawesi. And what's interesting in the Philippines is that we don't really have, we don't re, we're not really famous for wet markets, but what we're famous for is uh, we have a culture of drinking among Filipinos. And when they drink liquor, we have the, the viand or the food that they eat is called pulutan. And bats are famous as, uh, is, is a famous pulutan or drinking viand uh, for drinking sessions. So, so that's where the uh, documentary interview, the, those who catch bats as their uh, meal for their drinking sessions. So this is us. This is where we visited the University of the Philippines. So we thought, oh, it's just a laboratory where they cat, where they have a lot of bat carcasses. And it, but we were a little, we were caught. Not we were we expected a hike, but we were uh, a little, I guess, surprised that the hike will be. We did not. We kind of underestimated the hike. We just thought it will be a, a little walk down the park. But apparently, this is my team, my photographer, videographer, and my co-writer Romina. It was initially just a flat. Uh, trail and eventually you know we are surrounded by trees so the university of the philippines is basically located at the uh foot of the mount makiling so that's why the, that university is famous uh, is known for its uh, biological research and then and then we were we had to climb through this slope we thought that that was just the slope like one step even this one is difficult to climb because of the moss covered stones and obviously we don't have photos anymore of what, the, what we have to hike because of this was basically the slope that we have to climb through. Uh, is Romina, maybe Romina, Romina has a particular experience about uh, climbing through the rattan. We, have, we had difficulty with climbing rattan branches. Can you share a short anecdote, Romina, about that experience? Yeah. Um, hello everybody, good evening. So initially we, we were already advised to wear um, proper clothes such as um, pants and um, proper footwear for the hike. But as Mark said, we really were taken aback by the hike. Um, there were a lot of spiky rattan. It's a, it's a local tree here in the Philippines. We didn't expect it to be that spiky and it really itched. <laughs> Even if you were wearing proper proper pants and proper equipment, you, mm. it was really hard. And especially since um, once we go up the mountain, I think Priya Mark has a few photos after, um, the scientists were actually wearing the PPEs as we yeah. got down, as we were going down, um, I think we have Markle show a yes. little bit more later. Thank you, Romina. I particularly remember Romina because I don't know, maybe I'm more, I hike mountains myself, and Romina is not a mountain person. He's, she's more of a beach person. We were laughing about it. We, I'm more of a mountain person. She's a beach person. And she was practically crawling through the mud. <laughs> so that was an interesting challenge that experience also. So moving on, thank you, Romina, for that. So when we got up the slope, it was a small, basically a small, uh, a small, uh, a slope where basically it's a flat slope where we have, a, where there was a crevice above us where the bats are roosting. So I'll show photos later. So this is my photographer taking photos of the scientists setting up the mist nets. I hope you can see the mist net that they set up. And this is where, and when the, on top of the slope, they were, they were their PPE. In fact, we were advised to wear PPEs, no? but eventually we decided against it because it was such uh, a way. Mark, yes. uh, Mark, very interesting photos indeed. Uh, yes. For the sake of time, uh, yes. if you could um, share with us, us your, your experience of interacting with the community and uh, your biggest learning from, from reporting this story, uh, that would be beneficial to, I think, all of those who have attended, who uh, joined right. us here today. So yeah. I'll skip to this. I'll skip to the Dumagat community. So, well, these are the photos of us. Uh, this is uh, the struggle, of course, was taking notes in the dark. This is Romina taking notes with her cell phone, and this is me taking my, my notes in the dark. And when going down, that what Romina said was that the scientists even were did not even take off their PPEs, whereas we and they did not they they did not struggle going down, but we had to struggle because we have to wait until dark. It was until dark when we finished. So that's it. <laughs> so this was the output and 
we use code cards based on our interviews. And uh, based, uh, we, have, we also had research on the, the, the research on basically the previous research on bat viruses. And we decided that it would be an interesting material for a map because the research material, these, the journal articles contain details about where bats, the bats were caught. So it was an interesting for us to detect possible hotspots for coronavirus. So, so these are yeah. the outputs. All right. Mark, I'll come back to you. I'll come back to you uh, by the end. Uh, maybe now I would like to move on to uh, Aswati. Uh, right. who, Aswati who did uh, a, a very in-depth report on the Nipah virus, one of the deadliest um, deadliest uh, viral outbreaks uh, of our time. Um, and uh, it, I know I was, I was your mentee, mentor, uh, Aswati, and I know the challenges that you faced in doing this story. But one of the challenges that particularly struck me was, you know, approaching the family members of those who have died of Nipah virus because these people have already undergone a lot of social stigma and ostracization by the society as well. They were already at their, on their, at their edge, you know, uh, mentally. So in such a uh, situation, how does a journalist approach this family? How does the journalist, you know, convince this family to open up and share their story, you know, how did you, how did you tackle this challenge and how did you come out how did you make them you know open up and, and share with you you know everything that they have they have uh, experienced share share with us that please when i reached Goikod to meet Cicelini's family i had to talk to a man who lost his wife and two little children who lost their mother at a very young age one was uh, five years old and the other was just two years old. So I had to talk to them like uh, I had prepared a, a long questionnaire to uh, ask, the, ask them. But unfortunately, I couldn't ask any of the questions because um, when, I, when I sit in, in front of them and talking about their mother or their wife or their daughter, uh, the family is including about 8%. Uh, Lini, uh, the Lini sister's uh, husband, her two sons, her mother, her sister, her brother-in-law, and their two children. It was about 10 people in so, the family. So, 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 Aswati, so, to... let, Aswati, so you were for the, for the, for the, you know, uh, convenience of our, uh, to, 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 just to help our uh, audience understand, Lenny is a nurse who died of, yes. uh, she was a caregiver and she died of uh, the Nipah. And uh, you were you were meeting her family, yeah? Yes. 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 Yeah. Please continue. Uh, okay. Lenny is a sister, a sister who died of Nipah while uh, treating a Nipah positive man. Uh, his name is Sabit. He was the first Nipah case of Kerala back in 2018. So I went to her home. Uh, her husband was just back from uh, Dubai and two little children. I the questions I asked them was. The first question was, how you feel? They face a social stigma from around their family, the society, the people, even from their own relatives. The children were somehow, uh, they were... Uh... Hello, can you, can you hear me, ma'am? Yes, Ashwati, please continue. Okay, when we talk to people who lost their loved one, we have to be very gentle. So I just talked to them about their mother. The little boys were talking about the about two days, just two years old uh, boy who hadn't know about their mother. So he was talking about, yeah, she loved me a lot, but I don't know how can I see her now. I think she's gone. He said something like that. So I, I just feel very painful. And it is very important to be gentle. Maybe we couldn't ask the questions that we have written. And somehow, we could get all the information we wanted. I don't know why. The um, Sajish, who is the husband of Lini, 
told me about his the social stigma and social impact that he faced from the society but the government the politicians the people the there are so many people who helped them, help them but there are people who never wanted to meet them at that time but now the 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 scenario is changed people are getting to know them the people are talking to them and he got a job here and he is uh, with his with his children and now they are very very happy in their family and he is um, uh, he he needs about a memory in their life but they are happy thank you aswati so so we have to as journalists it's very important to remember that stigma and discrimination are part and parcel are integral to zoonotic disease whether it's uh, covid or whether it's nipa virus the story is almost the same and at that a very important learning from aswati's experience is that always be gentle before you start bombarding the the victims or those left behind with your questions be gentle in your approach and have empathy uh thank you aswati uh now i would like to uh ask finika pina who has probably done the you know reported from one of the biggest you know potential coronavirus hotspots in our region which is a wet market so ever since we know that a possible origin of the current current covid-19 pandemic was a wet market um wet market itself again has emerged as 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 a taboo almost everybody is scared of that and fina you have gone there you have interviewed you know uh, the illegal meat traders you uh, who probably have gotten their meat through wildlife you know illegal wildlife uh, trade you have also photographed them which is a huge challenge because many of these people they just want to stay out and away from media as well as the camera so how did you make this impossible happen how did you manage to talk to and interview these meat traders and how did you get them be photographed yeah thank you stella um my biggest challenge was when i have to convince the butchers that i am not an animal lover or animal welfare activist so i was like pretending i am not even though i am a dog and cat lover actually since they got pressure to stop dogs and cats meat trade traditional market become a restricted area for animal lover and animal welfare activists so i spoke to them that i am a journalist who is working story about sonosis and thank god it worked then with friendly they were let me to take picture and interview them at a time yes it tell um uh, fina uh, can you share a little bit i'm pretty sure there's more into this story Could you share a little bit more about your approach? How did you make the first contact? How did you plan your visit to the market? And and how exactly did you interview the the butchers? Did you interview them in a group, or did you fix your interviews, arrange your interviews with individual butchers at a time? Um, I do interview them with individual by myself because I think maybe uh, how they. talk to women uh, so much different with men so i think is a uh, is the biggest strength to women journalist is how to um diplomate so okay i can let you take photos and interview them at the time do, do you have any photos to share with us or do any presentation yeah 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 I, please go ahead yeah Thank you Hana. Yeah. So um my story is about rabies and threat of zoonosis from wildlife trade in North Sulawesi. So uh, all photos on this 
presentation was taken by me at three traditional market. So the first, I want to say sorry, it might be bother you, but all pictures on this presentation tells what happened in my place. So there are three points as a background of my story. Next, Hannah. Yeah, living tradition. So the picture on the left is a dead dog, and you can see there is a python, and the right photo is a bat, burnt bat, and wild boar. So um, the people of North Sulawesi has living tradition to eat wildlife like bats, python, wild rat, wild boars, and domestic animals like dogs and cats. So several traditional markets and even supermarkets sell this kind of meat. Wildlife meat mostly sold in that condition, but for dogs and cats, some are sold alive and locked in iron cage. Um, as a tradition, this kind of extreme food can easily find at restaurants, Thanksgiving Day, or parties. And wildlife and domestic animals meat rate become a source of community's income in North Sulawesi. Next. The lack of awareness. So the photos on the left is a dogs on the cage, on iron cage to ready to be killed and the photo on the right you can see is a huge python on a long one traditional market one of the biggest uh, traditional markets who sell um, meat wildlife meat and dog and cat meat so living with this tradition for years makes public awareness of the dangers of zoonosis is very low and the facts found the community claim they are not worried about any infection or diseases and they are claim they are doing well by living this tradition um, actually community are already familiar with rabies rather than other types of zoonosis and not Sulawesi is an endemic area of rabies and boasts the highest number of deaths in Indonesia. The dog population that exceeds the number of vaccines. However, there are still many people who are not aware that rabies is very dangerous. The lack of awareness and up having to lose their life or their relative. I even interviewed my journalist friend who lost his son by rabies last year. Next, the lack of government's program. So, photo on the left is a um, cat, burnt cat, without fur. You can see it without fur and a wild boar and a python. And the photo on the right is a burnt dog. Bird dog. So, um, Sonosis is is not the main program of the North Sulawesi government. The budget for animal health is so much lower than the other program like human health, education, economic, infrastructure development, and other priority programs. For example, at 2021, government province budget for handling rabies is only. 375 juta rupiah or about 26,000 USD per year. Meanwhile, other priority programs can reach billion rupiah. Um, only one regency, that is Minahasa, has better management for rabies because it is a pilot project for One Health in Indonesia. But Controlling rabies with one health approach in Minahasa is still limited to treatment steps to fully prevent 
rabies through vaccination haven't yet been able to be implemented because the number of available vaccine inadequate for the growing dog population. And also, in here, um, media coverage for zoonosis and one health is very rare because the lack of knowledge about this issue. The lack of knowledge about the issue from journalists from the media. Next. Yeah, um, the wildlife and domestic animals meat rate become a community income for years. So I met two old Mac brothers named Hernie Sumilat, 79 years old, and Maxi Sumilat, 69 years old, the butchers who have been selling dog meat since they were teenager. Photo on the left, you can see them. This is me and them, and you can see how kind they were to the bottom. And actually, the butchers attacked by dog, by dog often. Their, their hand even being disabled, like Stephen Manopo, old man, 54 years old. The butchers who lost his finger by dog. Photo on the right is uh, Stephen hand, Stephen hands. And so for all the risks they have been doing, this is the way how they support their family. Likewise, with wildlife meat traders. Since the wildlife and domestic animals meat trade went viral, the sellers are getting pressure to stop this activity, especially for the dog and cats meat trades, which under pressure from animal over animal welfare activists from local to international organization. So this is this condition become a big challenge for me since I have to write about the story. The other side, this is about humanity. Many people depend on their income on this business. So I think this is more complicated than anyone would think. Thank you. Is it from me, Nala? Thank you very much, Fina. I completely agree. Uh, at Earth Journalism Network, we are also working on a global <coughs> program on zoonotic diseases spillover. And um, yeah, a big discussion is focused on how to uh, do risk reduction of exposure to zoonotic disease, uh, the zoonotic viruses, without disrupting people's food security. So for many communities, it's a simple matter of, you know, the, the, their food security and you can't just go on and tell them to stop this without providing, providing them a viable alternative. Uh, so this is definitely, uh, you know, it is uh, gaining momentum as a topic of discussion and increasingly being discussed by the scientists, scientist community as well um, as, as behavioral change experts. And I believe that most of your, your, um, uh, your presentation would be of great interest to, to all of those people. However, taking a step back to what you began with, there is something to uh, take away for journalists as well. And that is like, how do you, it, it is of course very important for a journalist to get this story, this ground story. But if you can't reach there, if you can't, begin to talk to these people, then you are not going to get the story. So this is where I heard from you um, uh, something, Pina, I'm be I believe that would benefit every journalist, that is make sure that you are not, you know, you are not, uh, you know, appearing to, to the community or to the traders as somebody who poses a threat. So you have to make your intentions clear. You have to assert them that you are there as a neutral journalist just to get the correct information. And again, you are not going to fabricate and you are not from, you are not an activist with, an, with a hidden agenda. That is very, very important to, it's very important to be, to be very clear and, and transparent about, about wh why you are here. Um, Great learning, thank you very much. We are running fast with our time. 
Uh, but I would like to take a minute here to say that Afina just mentioned that as a as a female journalist, she found it easier to 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 talk to the to to you know to people, especially uh, to women, and uh, that brings uh, the very important issue of keeping your story gen gender sensitive. In many communities, whether it's across Asia or Africa or probably across the world, most of the frontline communities have women doing a lot of uh, work that poses a bigger threat to their health. When it comes to skinning animals, when, whether it's gutting the, the animals or gutting live birds, you know, a lot of time men do the butchering or men do do the killing and women do slaughtering and women do the processing, the cleaning, which means women are putting their hands right into the gut of the animal and, 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 and they have a bigger threat, bigger, bigger threat of exposure. So keeping that in mind, as journalists, it is also our responsibility to see that our stories are gender equal and we are getting it right as far as gender is concerned. In fact, if there are more bigger threats to women or to children, we need to make those points highlighted through our stories as well. Because as field reporter, again, it is our duty to, to tell the story as it is. Um, so this is where I would, I would ask uh, Fina again. Uh, Fina, did, how, uh, did, did you say, did you feel the same that women in North Sulawesi probably have a higher risk of, of, you know, getting rabies or any other zoonotic diseases if there is outbreak. Did you ever feel that way? Fina, mungkin perlu saya bantu? Apakah jurnalis di uh, Sulawesi Utara seperti Fina sendiri, terutama jurnalis perempuan, mengalami atau merasakan adanya risiko yang lebih besar untuk terpapar terhadap penyakit-penyakit seperti rabies, zoonosis seperti rabies, dan yang lain-lainnya? Menurut Fina seperti apa risiko yang dihadapi oleh jurnalis perempuan di uh, Sulawesi Utara? Um, yeah. I'll answer in bahasa Indonesia and will help by foreign. Um, ya. Yeah. Tentu uh, resiko ini menghantui semua, dan termasuk saya juga, saya baru saja gigit anjing saya di wajah seminggu yang lalu. Yes, this is something that haunts most of us, uh, especially women. Uh, she said she's just, she was just bitten by her dog last week on her face. And you can see, uh, yeah, you can see the... Lihat wajah saya ini lukanya dan saya saya sementara dalam masa vaksinasi rabies dan saya kira semua orang di sini uh, punya resiko yang sama untuk um, terkena zoonosis apalagi rabies. She's currently in a uh, uh, vaccination phase so she has to isolate as well and she she feels like everyone in uh, North Sulawesi has faces that risk. Um, with with rabies or zoonotic diseases. Ya, seperti yang saya katakan tadi bahwa teman saya seorang jurnalis, dia seorang jurnalis yang setiap harinya membuat berita, itu harus kehilangan anaknya karena rabies, karena uh, kurangnya kesadaran tentang bahaya penyakit ini. Yeah, like I said, I like I mentioned earlier that I interviewed a, a fellow journalist who has has to lose his child to rabies. Maaf, anak, uh, jurnalisnya perempuan atau laki-laki? Laki. Yeah, uh, the, the journalist was was a male journalist. Thank you, thank you thanks. And thank you Florence for helping us with the with the you know the answer from you know. Um so again, uh just to uh, point out the very important uh thing that men and women, even if they are equally vulnerable, they might be vulnerable in different ways. Yeah, um, so, and, and as journalists, it's very important to see that when we are talking, where we are interviewing uh, and getting the story, we are not, 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 our story is not, you know, leaning on the testimony or the interviews of one particular gender, that we get the stories equally right from both sides. 
And if there are there is a bigger risk faced by women, then we get that story that that as well into our story. Um, uh, at this moment, I would also uh, like to take a, take a minute and uh, just to say that I see some some questions uh, and some comments in the chat. If you do have a question, please bring them onto our Q and A uh, page. We are we are constantly screening uh, that page. Uh, and I, I read some comments in the chat as well. And I would say that for all those journalists, you know, who are interested in reporting zoonotic diseases, uh, please do visit Art Journalism Network website. We have a lot of resources for you already in our in our website. And we also have a free e-course that you can take and you know equip yourself with the knowledge that you need to cover zoonotic diseases so you can enroll you know and you can take this course in your own time uh we we have more resources we in fact very soon we are also going to create a, that a guideline as well but all of that is coming again by the end of this event right now i will <coughs> uh, highlight that you know these stories that you heard from Mark, from Aswati, and from Fineke uh, are no matter how you know bothering uh, or, or how disturbing they are, they are extremely important to 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 be told to the world. And but to do that, we need to provide uh, these journalists you know all kind of support that they need. You know, whether it's financial support, such as a grant, whether it's editorial support or mentorship support. And with that, I would like to go to Jaya Sridhar, who is, you know, who, who, who is, uh, she, she was modest enough to say that she's not an expert, but she very much is. In fact, she has been instrumental in the course that I just mentioned that you can take on zoonotic diseases, how to report this, this zoonotic diseases. Uh, she was, she was, um, you know, uh, brain behind that, and she has always also had a lot of, um, you know, experience in guiding and mentoring health journalists. So, Jaya, my question today to you would be, you know, as a mentor, as an expert, what are the most common errors that you see journalists, you know, uh, making? What are the biggest mistakes uh, that you see them making, and how would you advise them? To, to avoid these errors. Um, thank you, Stella. And, and again, um, I, I think what, what really brought the Zoonosis course, uh, excellent Zoonosis course of the Earth Journalism Network into being is the hard work of the entire team uh, at EJN. I had the great pleasure and privilege to review the course and uh, it's absolutely wonderful. And I would strongly recommend anyone who's logged into this webinar and, and your networks to enroll in the course. It's, it's an absolute treasure house of information. Um, on the mistakes, um, I, I was, as I was listening to these brilliant presentations and the frontline experiences of journalists, uh, you know, some questions came to mind. Um, uh, I haven't yet had the opportunity to read all these stories, but what, one of the common, uh, factors that runs across the coverage of zoonosis in general is that the stories are often focused on a particular outbreak or a particular episode or a particular community or a particular locality. And um, if the journalist sort of contextualized it in the larger sort of understanding or the philosophy of One Health, um, it would it would make a huge difference, and that would really what uh, make policymakers sit up. So that whole confluence of environmental, human, and animal health has to be explained repeatedly through the stories. And I think that every one of the stories, if not, should could not just explain the problems, could not just explain the spillover aspect or exactly what happened, but it, if they could link it to governmental responses or what is happening in terms of cross-sectoral convergence and collaboration to address these issues, it would make a massive difference. Uh, there is a global reawakening and, and momentum that's coming into place following the COVID-19 pandemic about the importance of One Health. It's become uh, a, a front, front and center uh, 
issue in the minds of policymakers. And I think it's up to us journalists to really set the agenda there. And we can only do that with sensitive reporting. So what is this cross-cultural, I mean, cross-sectoral convergence that I'm uh, talking about? It's essentially uh, journalists needing to go to several departments, not just the health department, not just talk to the virologist or track them on their, uh, you know, sort of uh, expeditions into the forests to, you know, track the bats. That's one part of the story. The other part is really looking at the larger government policies. It's interviewing the wildlife, uh, you know, sector, people from the wildlife sector. It's interviewing veterinary doctors. For instance, a story, um, you know, about the Nipah virus outbreak in, in Kerala. Um, what might have been one way of sort of anticipating something like that if, is if journalists kept in touch with veterinary doctors who were doing epidemiological surveillance of any, um, you know, sort of uh, uh, outbreaks among bats. So that we, we rarely bring veterinary veterinarians into our stories or forefront them. You know, they're always seen as a sort of a, a, a second rung medical professional, but I think that they really are the stars of uh, they should be become the stars of zoonosis stories. So being in regular touch with the veterinary uh, doctors and the surveillance that they do is a key aspect of being able to be one step ahead to break a story. The second major uh, set of people one needs to be in touch with are people in the wildlife sector. You know, the wardens and they could uh, give us, you know, what's going on in the forest in terms of both deforestation as well as, uh, you know, the poaching, uh, a part of it, which is very, very important and to be able to track that and to forecast those trends ahead of time to uh, is is really key and i think that the the third um, uh, sort of major uh, important set of people really are uh, the policy makers who are trying to bring this convergence about you know bringing the health sector specialists together with veterinarians with wildlife specialists with with uh, the other national larger national programs it's really key to mesh all these different specialties together to bring about the cross sectoral convergence and there are people sitting in the public health sector like for instance in india the national uh, you know communicable diseases program uh, has officials sitting in there who are trying to bring about this convergence. So what are their challenges and what are their issues is, I think, a really important story to cover. I just, because we heard so much about rabies, uh, you know, from Finike, I, I just wanted to give an example, sort of a related story about what, what happened with rabies control in, in Tamil Nadu. Uh, you know, Tamil Nadu has always sort of uh, stood apart from the other Indian states in the sense that we were the first state in the country to have a separate public health department and someone a directorate of public health within the larger uh, health uh, you know department so we paid a lot of attention to public health and it was also the first uh, sort of state in the country to have a dedicated uh, rabies control program a state level rabies control program so if you look at what happens with uh, rabies control there's someone sitting out there tracking the dog population in urban in the urban settings there's someone looking at waste disposal wherever there are huge accumulation of uh, you know waste uh, food waste particularly around hotels uh, you know, they, it attracts a lot of dogs to that place. And then, you know, they start breeding somewhere close by. So someone was tracking uh, the garbage uh, situation in, in the urban areas. And then you had someone tracking uh, rabies cases, right? So that must have been someone in the health sector, right? Someone was looking at dog licensing rules. Someone was looking at, uh, you know, uh, family planning, sterilization of, of, uh, uh, the dog, of strays. So there were these different people and someone else was looking at anti-rabies vaccination, right? So these different sectors, although they work from different specialties, uh, including the uh, sanitation workers, the urban planning people, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the uh, RSPCA, the Blue Cross and so on, they all met frequently enough to triangulate all, all of this data. So the veterinarians, uh, you know, uh, kept a track of uh, rabies uh, data among the dog populations, and they passed that on to the health specialists who would then tell them about how many people with, uh, you know, with, who, with dog bites that they vaccinated, who would then triangulate that data with, you know, the, the uh, number of dogs, you know, the, someone was tracking the population. So it was, it was 
different specialists working in different areas, but who triangulated that data and who came together to sort of try and bring down the number of cases of uh, rabies. You know, India accounts for nearly half the uh, number of rabies cases in the world. So this was a really interesting program. So I think um, I should probably stop here, but I'll still make a case for one very important thing that journalists need to do, which is really to go to different sectors and talk to specialists across different sectors to really put one health up front to make sure that people get it that this is not something you know people come to the health sector at the very end after they fall sick literally to put a band-aid on your wounds right but the problem the roots of the problem live uh, lie far away and i think that bringing all these different interviewees and different um, interactions with different experts together into your stories at least bring them together even if they're not talking to each other which we really want them to do at least bringing them together in your stories will help to keep uh, you know putting this picture of one health what it means it's different different specializations talking together and coming together and i think that's really uh, the hugest uh, the biggest mistake that journalists are uh, you know sort of making in their stories. thank you so, uh, thank thank you jaya thank you jaya i think you you almost hit the <laughs> nail on the head with this this the the mentioning the cross sectoral exports i will just quickly add to the sectors that Jaya mentioned, you know, the veterinarians are very crucial to talk to, to interview those uh, who are doing the surveillance. Uh, those are the, you know, the officials in the wildlife sector, those in the water sector, for example, as well, because in, 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 uh, in many countries, especially those who, uh, you know, uh, communities where bats are, you know, <coughs> a big, uh, you know, there is a big bat population often the source of the virus is also the stale water. So safeguarding the water sources that the community uses. In fact, you would be surprised to know that some people are now also suggesting that architects be talked to because those, they may play a role in, you know, building this, you know, designing a house so that, you know, the, especially if you are living communities that live in close proximity to forest, where there is a bat population. So there is frequent, you know, coming in of bats, bats coming into contact of the humans. So to stop that, you build the house in a way, low cost houses in a way that the community has, you know, less, uh, you know, less exposure. So the, the, there is a, in, indeed, there is a huge uh, list of people, experts that, you know, you can, we can all talk to, we should talk to, to make, give, make, just, just do more, you know, give, make the story more informative and, you know, uh, make the story more useful for anybody looking into, looking for more in-depth information. Uh, so with that now, we are almost uh, coming to the end of our, our, our event today. We have received some questions. Uh, one is, did the grantees find it difficult to unpack scientific concepts such as zoonotic spillover in their stories. I will let Aswati answer this question because Aswati, you talk to you, interviewed the One Health Department head. You also uh, interviewed uh, the health minister of your state. You interviewed uh, you know, experts from different sectors. So how hard or was it easy for you to, to you know, you know, include all the scientific information that you received from these experts. How, how did you include them in your story? Was it difficult or was it relatively easy? Actually, I would say, ma'am, it was tough for me to find an expert, the perfect expert for my story. So I was researching on my story and I found very lately that there is an One Health Research Center in Kerala, which is under the veterinary university of the state in Vainad district. So I went there and talked to the uh, talked to the officer in charge, Dr. Pejit, and he said, and then I know that the state is planning something to make people aware about the One Health approach to combat zoonotic diseases in, in the state. So it was difficult for me to find that expert. It is really difficult. So I, you may know that I said you, that yes, ma'am, I found somebody, so I could go to him and ask him about the theories that nobody knows in the state. I would say so, I don't. So, so I, Swati, even so, I am a journalist. 
Sorry, Ashwati. So okay. the information that you got from the One Health expert, was it easy to understand? Was it easy to include in your story? Uh, I would say it was not easy for me because I, I, I even though I'm a journalist, I didn't know about the uh, the theory of One Health approach and the advocacy. I don't know that. So he he briefly explained everything to me. But then I have to research along about the approach and I return back to my office and I had to read books and I had to uh, explain somebody and yeah, it was tough for me. Ah, so it needed extra work on your part, right? Yes. I think that kind of, thank you, that kind of answers the question that yes, they, when you do the interview, uh, the, the, the ex sectoral experts, you do get the information, but that you cannot just leave it there. You need to do more research. You need to do make some extra effort to understand and make that story relevant, you know, that, that information relevant uh, or presented in your story in a relevant way. Uh, we only have a couple minutes more. Uh, I would like to quickly say that Jaya just now mentioned data. And on this, we have uh, a data tutorial as a resource available to you in our website. And also we are soon going to, you know, bring in a, a, a special tip sheet for all journalists. So keep an keep eye on our website. There will be more resources for you. In the meantime, you can, you can enroll and you can take the course that Jaya also just mentioned. Do take the course, do check out the data tutorial so that you can make your story more data rich when you, you report in the future. And we will be coming out with a tip sheet for everybody, all journalists very soon. Uh, we have just uh, two minutes uh, left. Before we say, I say goodbye, one quick minute I will give to Mark, who I had to cut short. Mark, if you can just quickly share in one minute your, your biggest learning from the story that you did. Yes, hello. Can I share my screen again? I'll just one quick, I'll just one quick share one quick photo. Well, basically what I found very interesting about the gender issue, right? The gender is that, in fact, one of the, when we visited the community, one of the uh, leaders that we have to talk to, the, the indigenous leader is actually uh, a woman. And in fact, she was, she has a very uh, deep, insightful, uh, she feels very emotional. She feels very passionate about fighting for the rights of indigenous people, especially uh, their right against, not, uh, especially, uh, you know, how they endured being discriminated against because of their culture. And they all just wanted to be respected about, even about their uh, uh, culture, even about their, you know, food customs, even if it involves bats. So I think very interesting that uh, we, even, even in stories such as these, we have to give space to, 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 uh, to women and, in part, in particular, particularly in our story, the the indigenous leader that we have that we interviewed, the woman is, uh, in fact, I, uh, I, I heard you, Mark. Just because we are out of time, the the yes, learning anyway, here is that there you. are women. Yeah. women when you when you go into a report, a reporting into a community on the ground, don't always have the preconceived idea that all the experts are going to be male. Do look yeah. for female experts as well. Right. And when you do get them, you might find them right in, inside the community. You know, do give them the credit <laughs> or the, the, the attention that they so deserve and help bring out those voices because they might give have some valuable information as well as some solution for, for, the, for, for everybody. So with that, thank you again. Uh, I know that probably after having this conversation, many of us would feel the need of having a round two of this, this conversation. Uh, we, will, we will see that we can gather again, but right now, thanks everybody. Thank you, Jaya, Pina, Florence, Romina, uh, Mark, and Aswati. Thank you all. And thanks to everybody who joined us today and stayed on till the very end. Have a good evening. And have a good day. See you again very soon. With that, bye and stay well and stay safe. Bye. Thank you, Stella, and everyone. Bye. That was bye, great. Everybody. Thank you.